Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our October webinar. I can't believe it's already October. I am Donna Prosser. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And today we're talking about creating a person-centered culture of safety and why it's so hard after all of these years of, of, of working on this. So um, we uh, today have some, some uh, broad objectives that we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna to define the term of, you know, what is person-centered culture of safety? Talk about how that relates to high reliability. Talk about what we've done over the last 25 years to improve that. Um, and then talk about what's happening right now, especially with the, the impact that COVID has had. And then as always, we are gonna um, try to give you some best practice recommendations about how you can um, improve a patient-centered culture of safety in your organization. So as always, we will be providing continuing education credit for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians through MedStar Health. Um, you will um, receive an email from MedStar if you have registered as a physician, a nurse, or a pharmacist looking for that credit. If you are a respiratory therapist, uh, check with your local organization. You'll be able to find out whether or not you can use this credit um, towards your requirements. So you'll receive um, an email from MedStar Health directing you how to obtain that CE credit. We also will provide uh, CE credit for healthcare executives, certified professionals in patient safety, board certified patient advocates, and um, certified professionals in healthcare quality. Um, for ACHE, go ahead and log in that information into your own account. You'll receive a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation if you're looking for CPPS or BCPA credit. And if you're looking for CPHQ credit, then we will send that information to NACU and they will document it for you. As you can see on this slide, none of our presenters today and nobody on our planning committee has any financial disclosures to report. Um, and just like all of the other webinars that we do, please do ask questions. Um, you can utilize the chat function if you'd like to make some comments or ask questions in the Q&A. We do have 15 minutes reserved at the end for questions, but we may answer them as we go, depending on, on, uh, on how the conversation is going. So with, um, I, I would like to go ahead and uh, introduce our esteemed panelists today. We're really excited to be joined by um, Anthony Staines. Anthony is uh, the Patient Safety Program Director for a uh, Regional Federation of Hospitals in Switzerland. We also have Abdulayla Alhasawi. He is currently the CEO of Nordex Diagnostics and Discovery, but was also the former Director General of the Saudi Patient Safety Center, which is a WHO collaborating center in Saudi Arabia. And then we have Joanne Shelby Klein. Uh, Joanne is a nurse, a, 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 a director, a writer. Um, she is also a patient advocate and currently is the patient clinical site liaison for link two trials in the United States. So I'd like for um, each of our panelists to just tell a little bit about yourselves. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that everybody can see your faces. Um, and so let's go ahead and start with Adjalela. Tell Tell everybody a little bit about your background. Hi everyone. I think I would I should say good day because we have global uh, audience. Uh, my name is Abdel Al Hausawi. I'm a transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon, both uh, American and Canadian board certified. And as uh, Donna mentioned, I was the, uh, the the founding director general of the Saudi Patient Safety Center, which is a WHO collaborating center in patient safety. Uh, last year, also during the uh, the G20 presidency, I helped uh, introduce patient safety on the G20 agenda, which continues to be on the uh, G20 agenda during the Italian presidency. So, uh, you know, uh, con uh, I continue to be uh, very much uh, passionate about patient safety uh, and involved in different uh, settings, uh, both nationally and globally, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Well, welcome. We're so excited for you to join us today. Um, Anthony, you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Thank you, Donna. Well, uh, I've been for 10 years a CEO of hospitals in Switzerland. And then I went, went back to studies and did a PhD with uh, research on quality improvement programs in hospitals. Uh, the research question was, do quality improvement programs in hospitals lead to improved outcomes for patients? And I... Uh, fell in love with quality and safety 
for uh, for healthcare, and I've stayed in that field for the last the the past fifteen years now. Wonderful. Well, welcome, and thank you for joining us as well. And Joanne, tell us a little bit about your background. Greetings, everyone. Um, I am Joanne Shelby Klein. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I have been a registered nurse for over 37 years, and I'm very passionate about patient safety. Um, one of the first lessons I learned in nursing school was safety first, and I've adopted that as a lifestyle as a nurse. Over the course of my career, I've worked 21 years with renal patients, both as a hands-on dialysis nurse and as an educator. I've also worked with multiple sclerosis patients. I love doing nurse writing and developing patient education and staff education materials. I'm also a very passionate patient advocate, not only for my husband who has high functioning autism, but for many relatives and currently members of the St. Peter and St. Paul Ukrainian Orthodox Church, where I hope to start a faith community nurse program and focus on person-centered uh, safety. One of the things that I enjoy is doing quality assurance and CQI, just learning and growing as a nurse and as a patient. I am a cancer survivor and I use that experience to look at things from the patient perspective because I've learned things good and bad. And I hope that I can share those experiences not only today, but also in the future, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Great, well, welcome, Joanne. Well, I'm gonna start by asking um, all three of our panelists to um, you know, briefly define for us, what, what do you think we mean when we say person-centered culture of safety? And, how does such a culture drive reliability in healthcare? I'll start with uh, Abdulayla. Thank you, Donna. So, so, so let me start with a, with a quote by um, Aristotle. You know, whenever I talk about patient safety, which is, uh, he said, uh, our problem is not that we aim too high and, and miss, but our problem is that we aim too low and hit. So I think when it comes to, to patient safety, uh, that the goal should be zero harm. And, and uh, if, we, if we're looking at the person-centered uh, culture of safety, um, and Donna mentioned the uh, high reliability organizations and, and, and uh, aviation is a good industry that uh, everyone uses and it's, it's probably the, the world's safest uh, industry. Uh, in 2019, there were uh, around 39 million flights uh, throughout the globe. And even though uh, many of us in healthcare take for granted that 10% of patients will be harmed, the aviation industry has a different way of looking at things. And in that year, if they only, you know, uh, taken not 10%, not, not 1%, but 0.1% of uh, harm that would have been acceptable to them, we would have ended up with almost 40,000 airplane crashes. But you know, thankfully that never happened and it would never happen in the aviation industry just because uh, you know, the culture of safety in that industry is way up there. I think we're still uh, here. And the, the question is how can we move it up in that direction? And, and last year during the G20 presidency, I, I uh, presented five main uh, areas where I think uh, are the kind of the, the, the causes for persistent uh, implementation gaps. So even though that we know what to do, which is kind of, we've done a very good job bridging the knowledge gap over the past 20 years of the global patient safety movement, I believe there's still a lot of work to be done to bridge the implementation gap. So one was the, 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 the culture of safety uh, itself. And it, it, you know, whenever you think of culture of safety, think about the leadership within uh, the healthcare uh, facilities and, and, and organizations, uh, different levels of, you know, not just the C-suite, but also mid managers and, and, and even unit uh, managers. Uh, do they come to work every day thinking that the safety of patients, the safety of the staff, the safety of organization is the number one priority? I think that is a very important question. 
aviation industry safety views safety as religion. I think we're far away from that vision when it comes to uh, healthcare. Another important part is is is, is advocacy. Uh, you know, just compare the global climate change movement with the global patient safety movement, and you'll 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 get a sense of where where things are. Just ask ten persons of you know people around you. Have you heard of the global climate change? I've done that in my own family. I've asked my mother, I've asked my you know, siblings, I've asked my kids, three different generations. Every one of them heard about the global climate change. Do the same and ask him about the patient safety and then you will see that Delta. So I think there's a lot that we need to do and you know, such webinars and the World Patient Safety Days and, and others are actually good, good platforms, but I think we need to have talk about safety uh, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis, on a regular basis. You know, the third is the human factors, engineering and ergonomics. High reliability industries actually have integrated that into their day-to-day -day workings. You know, there's lots to be done. Uh, the fourth one is the uh, information asymmetry. So uh, the, the gap between the knowledge that we clinicians have and, and the patients and family is, is, is big, I think. Uh, unless we work on bridging that gap, we're going to have a persistent uh, safety challenges. So I think empowering patients, empowering families, empowering communities is, is the way to go. And finally, uh, not having a, a, a common you know, taxonomy and, and, and classification of, of, of harm. So for us to have uh, uh, platforms and, and, and shared learnings, we need to be using the same language. We need to be calling an apple an apple and an orange an orange. And sometimes even within the same hospital, maybe within the same department, uh, we have different ways of calling these harms. And, and that would ma makes it very difficult to actually uh, share the learnings and make sure that we're proactive rather than being reactive. So uh, these were the, the five reasons that uh, I, you know, I presented last year in the, 20, in the G20. I believe they continue to be the same. And we need to address every one of them if we really want to move towards, uh, you know, zero harm. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Well, absolutely. We're going to have to summarize those five points for everybody and make sure that we have that available as a resource for after the, um, after, on the, on the notes on YouTube. So thank you so much for that. Anthony, how about you? What do you think we mean by a person-centered culture of safety and how does it drive reliability? Well, I think, uh, Abdulayla has made a very good selection and it's difficult to add to things, but uh, <laughs> I, I would say one thing that I would add is uh, the awareness that we are in a high risk industry. I think uh, that's something important and I don't see that awareness everywhere I should see it around me. So that's one thing. Um, also to the word culture that uh, Abdulayla used, I would perhaps add the the, the, the key word of a just culture, by which I mean uh, a blame-free environment, where there is transparency about errors, about uh, adverse events, and where there is a focus on learning from these uh, events rather than uh, blaming people. I think that's something very important. Perhaps one key word I could add also is teamwork. And I'm, when I mean teamwork, I mean teamwork across uh, professions, across uh, disciplines, across ranks in the hierarchy. So that's something I think is, is important. And perhaps I would add one comment to the uh, person-centered uh, aspect. Uh, I think Abdulayla has already mentioned uh, engaging patients and families. Uh, I, I would perhaps add the idea of seeing safety through the patient's eyes. Uh, it has happened to me, I, I was organizing a, a large uh, uh, event and I had uh, a patient on the board of the organization of that patient safety uh, conference. And uh, the patient said, but uh, what do you mean by patient safety? And so we discussed it was preventing harm in, uh, in healthcare. And the, the patient said, yes, but what do you mean by harm? Now, cell went well, of course, of physical harm, etc. And the patient said, "Well, but it's much more than just preventing physical harm, isn't it? Also, psychological safety, 
Isn't it uh, preventing disrespect to patients? Does that belong to harm? And the patient said, I'm coming to your event only if you define harm as including disrespect to the patients. And I must say, I had not seen it as I'm a professional healthcare professional myself. I hadn't seen it that way up to then. And so it was quite revealing and it extended my definition and my understanding of patient safety culture. Uh, and that's what I mean by a person-centered uh, patient safety culture, seeing it through the patient's eyes. Thank you. Great points, great points. Joanne, how about you? That is a great point, Anthony, about looking at things through the patient's eyes, because as a patient who is also an RN, I see things from a slightly different perspective. And I think of my husband, I think of others that I have talked to, I don't realize the little things that can be, that we would consider harm, that to them they see as a norm. And I think asking the patient and the family members, what safety, what, what they need from us help them to feel safe and secure. One of the first things that I learned was safety first. I also learned as a part of that, that all of us as human beings are composed of our biological and physical health, our psychological health, our social health, and our spiritual health. We all blend together and both as clinicians and as patients, that influences how we view things. And from a patient perspective, maybe no physical harm was done to the patient, but what about the psychological harm of getting a cancer diagnosis or a chronic disease diagnosis, or suddenly being told that rituals and the faith practices that you normally follow, you no longer can, because it would cause physical harm down the road. And we need to take all of that into consideration. And I've always been a firm believer that every one of us, whether we are a housekeeper, security guard, registered nurse, nursing assistant, physician, therapist, that we have a responsibility every day when we set foot in our job and dealing with our patients remember that we make the biggest difference and it all starts with us if we believe that we're going to go in and do no harm in any of those areas today then we make a difference one person at a time and i think that's a really big thing to remember and some of that comes from being diligent and being observant looking at our environment and listening to the patient, not only with our ears, but with our eyes. What, what is their body language telling us? Is there something maybe we're missing that we can address? Therefore, as diligent caregivers and diligent patients, we can prevent something bad from happening. And that's how I look at things. And my perspective changed when I became a patient. And I realized that I had to take an active part in my healthcare, and asking the questions and saying the things that were important to me. And my goals were slightly different than maybe what doctor's goals were. Doctor's goals were just to keep me alive. My goals were not to just be alive, to be able to practice and continue the things that I needed to do for myself and how do we mesh those things together? And I think that's a big issue, big issue that we can address. And I think it starts at the training level. Whether you are in nursing school, medical school, you can teach that and help, them, help the students to learn that so that they can help teach it in turn to the patient. And it's a big challenge if we take it one small bite, one person at a time, we can do it. 
That's a great, great thought, Joanne, and kind of segue into my next question because, you know, we've been talking about this for a really long time. I mean, Abdelayla, you talked about the aviation industry. I mean, 25 years ago, we talked about, uh, you know, we, we started comparing healthcare to aviation and started talking about having a culture of safety. Why do you think we haven't fixed it yet after all this time? I think, I think, uh... I don't think it's 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 uh, it's for lack of trying. Uh, I, I believe uh, a the the mindset has to change, and 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 let me build up uh, build on what what Joanne just mentioned about uh, eating it. You know, uh, 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 in, in small bites. You know, the saying, "How do you eat an elephant? One one bite at a time." So if this zero harm is is the big elephant. Uh, we, 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 we continue to have in, in, in some of these small circles discussions about the question of whether zero harm is achievable or not. And I think this is not helpful because again, all the high reliability industries know that you know, zero harm is not ever going to be you know, done com com uh, completely. You will always have some incidents in all these different uh, industries, but they have managed to really drive the safety uh, in, in, in their industries in a, in a way that we, we did not. So, so I think the mindset is, a, is, is something that, that has to change. And I, and I believe we, you know, uh, we, we, we can't we can't do it alone. For the for the past twenty five years, you know, and, and, and many years, we 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 thought that we could do it alone as the care healthcare providers, and I and I believe we have to be humble enough to know that this can only be done in a in a in a co produced way. So, if we uh, and 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 you know, Anthony mentioned uh, the patient talking about you know what what do you mean by harm and. Imagine at the beginning of every admission or at the beginning of every encounter, even at the, at, at the outpatient setting, if we tell the patient who's going to have a hip replacement that, hey, listen, th this is, uh, let's, let's work on making sure that we work together to make sure that your journey through the hospital is a safe one. And we would write down, you know, these are the top five, 10 things to, to, to look after. And, and uh, this is what we will do to make sure that uh, you are safe. And this is what we want you and your family, because you know at certain points in the, the care, the patient is not going to be as much contributing. But I think if we look at the patient and the family unit, you know, look at the patient and, and the loved ones as one unit, I believe we can, we can really, uh, be proactive because this is uh, what, what, the, what the aviation industry does and what the high reliability industry they, they do. Uh, if, if, the, if harm happens at step 10, you know, they intervene at step one, two. Unfortunately, in healthcare, we intervene at step nine, sometimes at step 11 and 12 after, after the fact. So we're always kind of reactive, but we can do some simple interventions to be, to be proactive. But uh, part of also, uh, you know, transforming safety in healthcare is not to look at it as a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, kind of an independent from uh, from from the safety of the of the whole uh, ecosystem. So, uh, for the longest time, we thought that uh, you know, safety of patients are kind of. Uh, you know, in a, in a way, a zero-sum game, and and uh, where if we focus on the safety of patients, sometimes this happens to the detriment of, of, of the staff. And you know, we, we know about the second victim phenomenon and, and everything, and the and the and the burn uh, the burnout that happens in healthcare. But if we decide to go in a co-production strategy, where we would say that the safety uh, as a whole in healthcare means that the safety of patients is interdependent on, on, on the safety of, uh, of uh, healthcare workers and vice versa, and, and do it in a, in a way uh, that, that we empower the patients and families, 
I believe that would take us to the person-centered care because it's not even about just patients because if you if we're uh, and I, this is why I love your, your your title and of the webinar because throughout the care continuum we move away from just this kind of uh, uh, episodic uh, way of looking at care rather than it's the health the whole care continuum you know so you're talking about uh, primary care you're talking about home care and throughout this you know if we empower the the the, the individuals if we empower the patient and families, I think we can we can do it. So co-production, I believe, should be a big part of our strategic uh, initiatives moving forward. Awesome, you're absolutely right. I think um, you know we definitely. I, I love what you said about how you know we, we're looking at this at safety at step eight or step nine, um, and certainly not at the beginning. Anthony, you know that you're over a, a group of uh, of hospitals. You probably. Um, deal with hospital administrators all the time. What's your perspective on this? Why do, why do you think that, that we still haven't hardwired this in healthcare organizations from a leadership perspective? I have the feeling that there is a challenge with having the right expectations. Uh, and I mean, by that, there, there is probably some kind, uh, at least what I see around me is also some governance problem. Uh, what I see is boards of directors who are quite preoccupied with uh, dealing with the budget in one meeting and in the accounts in the next meeting, and then it goes back to the budget and back to the accounts. And sometimes they discuss uh, an architectural project, but I don't see quality of care and patient safety and person-centered care as much as I would like on the agenda. Um, I don't see that many hospital CEOs that are evaluated on patient safety. I see them evaluated on occupancy rates, on the balanced budgets and things like that. Um, so, um, I've been in the position of being a CEO of hospitals for 10 years, and uh, I, I had quite a number of pressures I was facing, but not as much pressure on patient safety and person-centered care as I probably should have. And so, uh, of course, as a CEO, you allocate your energy, your time on things that you are assessed on, that you are evaluated on. So. I think there is a need to, to shift the focus in, in governance on showing that it's, it's important. But to do that, we have to build understanding within the boards of directors about the safety issue. Like uh, I teach um, patient safety and quality of care for board mem members of boards of trustees. And uh, five weeks before the seminar, we do an online survey and we ask the board members, uh, what is the proportion of patients that get harmed in your healthcare institutions in, in your understanding? And we provide them uh, answers in a logarithmic scale. That means one in a million or one in 100,000, one in 10,000, one in 1,000, one in 100, and one in 10. The correct answer is one in 10 but quite a number of people answer one in 100,000 or one in 1 million. So if you believe that it's one in 100,000, why should you discuss that at a board meeting? But if it's one in 10, then it's absolutely urgent and key that it's discussed at a board meeting. So there are some, still some basic understanding and that drives expectations and it, it in my view, it sometimes creates a flawed system where the, uh, the incentives are not where they really should be. Wow, that's a really great point. And I, you know, I, wonder, I wonder how many folks on, the, on the, the call could take that back to their organizations and ask what people's perceptions are. It goes back to what Abdelayla was saying before about how the, the general public doesn't really even understand um, how, how significant this problem is. Um, Joanne, what's your, what are your thoughts from a patient perspective? Um, why, why do you think that it hasn't taken hold? You, you mentioned before too that, you know, patients sometimes just have an expectation that this is, 
you know, it, it, it happens. And as Bill said, and Bill Adams said in our, um, in our chat that there's an attitude in healthcare, things just happen. So get over it. You know, we call them complications. We call them side effects. Why is, why do patients tolerate that, Joanne? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, they were mowing, they were mowing the lawn outside. So I muted myself. One of the things that I see from a patient perspective, as well as a nursing perspective, is that there's not enough education to the general public about safety and how important safety is and how if you are treating your staff and your patients and family members who come to the hospital and creating a culture of safety where harm does not happen, in the long run, it saves you money. And it saves you resources in the form of lawsuits, in the form of lost time, in the form of time spent with patients. I'll give you an example in my own personal life. I was in a nursing facility, a skilled nursing facility for rehab. And I rolled out of bed while asleep. And I laid on the floor for over 30 minutes before anyone found me and heard me yelling. And one of the things that concerned me about that is that no one had informed me what to do if the call bell wasn't within my reach. How could I get a hold of someone? And there was no one rounding and coming in and taking a look, see what was going on in the middle of the night. And there was no education. The staff was not prepared to try to lift a 200 pound woman off of the floor to safely get them back into bed. Fortunately, as a nurse, I was able to fix the problem for them. Not all patients can do that. And I think we need to educate all of ourselves at the lowest level, whether it's in the hospital, a facility, and with the patients about how we can be safer and prevent things. One of the things a lot of nurses get frustrated about is the um, patient satisfaction surveys that are done here in the United States. And one of the questions that should be there that isn't is how safe did you feel during your hospitalization? Did you feel safe? If you did, why did you feel safe? And if you didn't, why not? And the culture of blame is also a problem. When, when, an, when a bad incident happens in the hospital, someone gets a wrong medication, or a medication gets missed, a treatment gets missed, there's automatically blame put on the person who didn't do it. We need to look at the system. We need to look at what's going on. How many patients did that staff member have to care for? How critical were they? What was going on in the environment? Was that patient able to give their name their birthday to make sure that they were the correct patient? Was that patient able to reach a call bell? We need to look at that and not blame the individuals, but look at the system and the causative factor. Over the last 40 years in healthcare, I have noticed a huge change here in the United States and that our patients are sicker when they come in the hospital getting discharged sooner and there is a decrease in staffing. We're not utilizing all of the nurses, nurses aides, maybe bringing licensed practical nurses back into the case mix would help as well because then you have people who can educate and can observe, notice things. Another thing that I think would be great is if we could get more registered nurses and physicians on board of directors and board of trustees, because they are frontline workers and they understand what the individual patients and staff need. 
and letting their voices be heard and pointing out. Sometimes it's more cost effective to prevent than it is to actually have to deal with the consequences, both physically, monetarily, and emotionally. And what frightens me is years ago, they talked about a nursing staff shortage and how it was going to impact those of us who are in the baby boomer and later generations, because there's not going to be enough staff there to help. We're seeing it come to light in the light of COVID. We're seeing a lot of nurses and doctors who are walking away. And we're seeing shortages everywhere. And we need to get a mindset on focusing on correcting all of those because as you correct shortages and you get enough people in place with good training, it will correct. So, and unfortunately, instead of it getting better, it got worse. And if we had another hour, I could tell you about the concepts that we learned years ago that aren't taught today for new nurses coming out and new doctors. And that's something we really, really, really need to think about in driving the culture of safety and reliability. And we also need to remember Culture of safety, patients talk. People in the community talk about hospitals. And you can sit in any restaurant or social hour in a church or social gathering and you'll hear somebody say, I will never go to that hospital because man, they don't do a good job. That hospital thinks they're doing a good job. They don't see the reality of what patients are seeing. And there's that disconnect somehow we've got to think outside the box and figure out how to put it together. That's great. Well, you guys have given us all so many um, ideas already about what we can do to, to fix this. Um, Abdulayla, I do have a question though. I know a lot of times I talk to clinicians and um, they, you know, their opinion is that they don't really want to involve patients and families in their care. They perceive that, you know, their, their role is, is there to be the advisor, to be the driver of care. You know, what, what do we need to do to change that mindset? Yeah, well, what, such a great question. <clears throat> uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, there is this misconception amongst uh, clinicians and specifically amongst uh, physicians, you know, like myself, that, uh, you know, patients should stay in their lane. You know, you should just be a patient, you know, we, we will tell you what to do. And I think uh, there's a little bit of arrogance there. There's a little bit of lack of uh, understanding of how the safety works. And uh, I, I believe this has to change and uh, it's, it's gonna create a lot of, uh, you know, interesting conversations, some, some discomfort, but I believe it starts with uh, an empowered patient coming, you know, to to the to the clinic. An empowered patient coming to uh, the, uh, you know, to be admitted. I believe, uh, you know, just just to 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 give some practical solutions. Uh, uh, you know, we should st start seeing patients in in uh, in boards. In uh, so, uh, you know, the whole saying of safety from 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 the board to the ward. Uh, so we should, we should start uh, having patients, uh, not just, you know, having the optics of it, having a patient representative coming in uh, to the board every now and then. We should have a patient representative who's not a clinician, who represents, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the population that the, the, that the hospital looks at, uh, taking the agenda for, 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 for patients forward, you know, trying to empower them to ask of us the, 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 the tough questions. I think we should redefine safety in, in, in two different ways. We should redefine it because safety now is defined as the absence of harm, but that's a kind of a one size fits all definition. And I, I don't think it, it helps the patient who's being admitted today to, to the hospital. It doesn't help the patient who's uh, actually being wheeled into the emergency room as we speak. I think the definition should be personalized for every individual coming in contact with the with the with the healthcare system 
So how, how can we work together? But, but, it, but it needs to be personalized and it needs to be co-produced. So we, I think we've learned enough now that there's no way that we can do it alone as, as providers. And I think we have to have the humility to say that, but then we have to, to, to show the solutions of how we can co-produce this. I think one of the most important things is to empower patients and families to speak up. When you look at many of the Sentinel events, you know, uh, uh, there, there was someone within the vicinity who uh, realized that there was something going wrong, but they were not empowered to speak up. And it, you know, sometimes it's, it's a junior uh, team member that is not empowered to speak up. It's a new nurse who kind of joined in, uh, who was intimidated by the, by the attending. You know, uh, I think Sheila here mentioned that the nurse patient ratio and Joanne talked about it. I, I, I think this is a very, very important aspect that also can connect uh, the, uh, the, the two safeties, you know, together. Uh, so recently, we, uh, the Saudi Patient Safety Center, I continue to go to say we because I, I've been in the center for, for, for a long time, uh, issued the, uh, a white paper about uh, the patient, uh, sorry, the nurse patient ratios. And this was, uh, there was also uh, a work that we've done with ICN and I presented in, in 2019 during the ICN conference. And, and uh, I believe uh, what is happening in, 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 in the, in the staff, staffing ratios and specifically nurses and midwives because they represent more than 50% of the health workforce uh, is something that really needs to, you know, we, ha we have to have uh, we have to basically, you know, sound the alarm about pushing nurses into kind of taking more and more patients without having the, uh, you know, uh, the time or, or the way of, of, of looking after them. You know, just to look at aviation again, aviation has something called the minimum equipment list. So any airplane anywhere in, in the world, in a commercial flights, the airplane does not take off if that minimum equipment list is not ticked. Why don't we have minimum equipment list and uh, sorry, minimum safety list within our uh, uh, clinical units? So why why are we pushing staff and 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 again, I would say uh, nurses. It's usually that the offenders is us physicians kind of pushing nurses to uh, to actually take more and more ratios rather than starting you know closing beds and saying uh, that is the maximum ratio. You really have to have a, a, a very good reason to take up more uh, patients with the same staff, because again, this this would kind of disconnect the safety. Because what we will do, we're, we're actually putting that nurse into more risk. So when we're compromising his or her safety uh, in the name of we're trying to actually uh, increase the, the 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 care of patients, but we know that actually both safeties suffer. I'm calling, I'm speaking about them as the two safeties, but I think we have to connect them together as one safety. Uh, so so the, the, the patients, uh, the nurse patient uh, ratio is, is something extremely uh, important. But, but I believe one, one thing that we, we really need to do is, is, is to really put the safety agenda at the level of the board. And, and, and we really have to hold the board and, and the entire organization accountable. Because what happens is, you know, the analogy of the blunt end, sharp, sharp end. So what happens at the sharp end, that the same nurse who was actually pushed to take up more uh, patients, when he or she makes a, an error, who, who will fire her? The, the board, you know, the, the CEO of the hospital. So people at the top who did not create this, the environment for, for a safe practice. So, so I think, that, that accountability matrix has to be connected. And, and the next time the board or the CEO or you know, department head wants to fire someone or for, for a safety event, he or she should look in the mirror and know that they're as culpable, if not more accountable for whatever happened as the, the, the individual at the, at the sharp end. Well, it looks like Sheila Lightfoot's giving you some, some great applause here. So, and Christy Hughes as well. So, and I think that, that's very well said. I'm, I'm a nurse myself. I've been a nurse for 31 years. And when I look at nurse staffing, it's the same today as it was 31 years ago. 
and the number of things that nurses have to do now um, are is far far different. So uh, so very very well said. But you know, Anthony, this is th these are our fabulous recommendations. Um, you know, uh, so you know, Abdullah said close beds if you don't have enough staff. So you know, I, I I'm sure that you as a previous hospital administrator probably knows how that would go over in in organizations. So how how do we actually make that happen in hospitals? What do we have to do differently in administration? I would argue that perhaps the, the model or the vision that we have needs to be questioned further. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, um, the image of patient centeredness, I think, has been very helpful to move away from paternal paternalistic care, top down care. Uh, professionals telling the patient what to do. And I'm glad that there has been the model of patient centeredness. But on the other hand, that idea of patient centeredness suggests the image of a circle where the professionals are, all of the professions, et cetera, and the patient is in the middle. And it seems a little bit like a team doing things for the patient that is in the middle of the circle. And I wonder if now we don't need to move away from this idea of we're a circle doing things for the patient to the patient is within the circle, is part of the team. Like Team Steps says the patient is part of the team. The Montreal model says the patient is patient partnership, which suggests the patient is in the circle and things are done with the patient rather than for the patient. And so uh, I think that's, that's uh, it, it's been done already. It's not a new idea, but I think we, the, we have, some of us has a little bit been trapped by this idea of patient centeredness, which means, yes, the patient in, in the center, but we shouldn't consider just doing for the patients, but with the patient. It's the idea, I think, of co-production, of co-design, and that's something we need to work on much more. Very well said. And that kind of leads into a question that Krista Hughes asked in the Q&A about how, you know, how do we get to that place from a patient perspective? Joanne, I wonder if you can answer Krista's question about, you know, how does the average patient know how to demand that to be part of the team, as, as Anthony was, was mentioning. You're on mute again, hon. Yeah, and I apologize. Um, I think it begins with educating and empowering the patient and telling them you're an important part of the team that is taking care of you. Do not be afraid to speak up. Speak up to the aid speak up to the nurse, speak up to the doctor and say, I have questions. When I was training patients to do their own dialysis at home, I used to tell patients that the only dumb question was the question you failed to ask. Because I think we need to remember that patients do have questions and they do have concern. And it might not meet the clinician's agenda, but if they ask it, it may give us perspective and opportunities. And it gets back to allowing them, having a sign when in the patient's room and in the hallways of the hospital is, don't be afraid to ask, speak up. You have a voice, don't be afraid to use it. And encouraging them and saying, great question. I'm really glad you asked that. Or, you know what? I never really thought about things that way. And letting it be a teachable moment between the patient and the staff. Because sometimes the patient can teach staff things they didn't know. And I'll use an example again from my own life. I had a home health nurse here yesterday dealing with one of my wounds. And um, she didn't know how to hold the end of tape under so that she wasn't wasting tape and having trouble wasting time to get the tape torn open. And I said, let me show you a trick. 
this is what you do. This is how you do it. She went, oh my gosh, it's so simple. And I didn't think of it. I had a patient teach me, a nurse of 20 some years, years ago, a mayonnaise jar is great for getting rid of insulin syringes, which is, is simple. It's basic. We learn from each other and needing more of those teachable moments. Those teachable moments can happen when you have good staff ratios. And when you think outside the box, maybe it can begin at home. You have a patient you're seeing in the office, they're having surgery. And you wanna prepare them for surgery and you send them the standard video and you give them the reading material one problem. The patient can only access the video once a week at the library. The patient is not able to read or is blind and the material is not written in, in braille or they have no one to read it to them. Think outside the box about retired nurses, retired doctors, retired physician's assistants who might want to work at home for a decent wage, could call that patient and talk to them on the phone and interact with them and provide the information and build a rapport. And it starts with that thinking outside the box and building and collaborating together as a team. And I know it frustrates my physicians when I do that. I get involved and I say, well, I did this or I know this and I understand that. I said, you're not looking at it from my shoes. And we need to sometimes put ourselves in that patient's shoes. And this brings up a point a little off topic about harm and preventing. I learned something new that through the Americans with Disabilities Act, the patient who is in a wheelchair who cannot make a transfer to the um, to a bed or to the exam table has the right to be, have a Hoyer lift used to lift them onto that exam table so that they get a thorough exam and things don't get missed. And we all know that doing a thorough exam is an important part of preventing harm. And so thinking outside the box and including people with disabilities and their advocates and their advocacy groups and utilize them as resources to help educate us as staff and educate each other as patients. Wow, that's so well said, Joanne. And, and I, we do only have just a few minutes left. So um, very, very briefly, I just want to review the continuing education credit information. And then I've got two more questions I'd like to try to squeeze in before, the, before we finish the, the program. Again, if you are a nurse, physician, or pharmacist, you'll receive an email from MedStar Health about what you need to do for continuing education. Um, you will um, receive a certificate from us if it's for CPPS or BCPA. Otherwise, you can either log it yourself or, CP or NAHQ will log it for you. And then um, if, and, you know, we always provide all of our educational content for free. We don't want for cost to be a barrier to improving patient safety anywhere. So, um, you know, if, if you are interested in helping us as a nonprofit to be able to continue to do that, then please visit our website um, and, uh, and you can donate there uh, to help us continue to keep this content free. Um, Abdulayla, I, I have a quick question from Krista. Krista and I actually did talk about this not that long ago. She had a patient family member who did speak up, who did ask questions, who wanted to be involved and they were dismissed. How do patients and families deal with that? What, what should their response be? I think, uh... Basically, you need you need to understand the, how how what, what the mechanics are within within that hospital or, or, or within that clinic. So, if you were dismissed by uh, the the you know the primary uh, physician, 
then you need to to look for a, a way to make your your voice heard you know so if there's a a, a, a basically a structured way of, of uh, complaining then i would i would follow that and and it's not about you know filing a complaint uh, so when you file a complaint i hope that you follow up with that and it's not about filing a complaint for the sake of filing a complaint it's it, it's it is uh to make sure that uh this is a very, you know, uh, high reliability industries would look at this as a, as, a, as a kind of a red flag. And I think we should look at this as a red flag because if you had a concern and you were dismissed and, and thank God as a patient or as a family member, nothing happened, you know, imagine the number of times that the same concern could, have, could end up in a, in, a, in a major harm or even death of a patient. So, don't think about it just for your own safety and for your own self. Think about actually doing it for the for the for the greater good. So, and, and I think that would be my the way of of of, of dealing with this uh, in a in a practical way. Great, great, and I do think you know I, I think in general you know as human beings we have to do a better job of communicating to each other, communicating our needs. We are hoping to be able to provide better education for patients and families to learn how to have those difficult conversations that a lot of people, um, you know, shy away from. Um, Anthony, last question that we have, or Joanne, I mean, I'm happy for, for either of you to jump in on this, but Anthony, you talked about putting how, how we've put the, the, the patient at the center of care, um, but we also often talk about patient-centered care versus person-centered care, and Yannick asked a really great question, you know, there's always this, this question of, is it person-centered care? Is it patient-centered care? How do we really define those, those roles? Um, and, and, and is it important? Well, in my view, uh, I, I would more use the term, term person-centered care because it's not just the patient. Patient implies often uh, acute care, hospital care, etc., whereas it would be other names in long-term facilities or in home care. Uh, at least in French, we use different words and we don't say patient, we say the inhabitant, the resident, uh, the, the, the user of the system, the beneficiary of the system. So it's, it's all of these people and it's often also the loved ones that go together in the con in the concept the family the, the loved ones the helpers etc so i would use a more generic word than than patient but of course the patient is a very important part of all that and uh, i think that the, the 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 patient on some respects has more information than the professional and more um actionable and useful information. The patient is an expert on how he or she lives with the disease. And that's something that no professional can provide better than the patient. And we should not forget that. Absolutely. And I can see Joanne and Abdelayla nodding when you said that, so. Yes. <laughs> Person-centered care is a great term to use. Within the face um, community nursing groups that I belong to, we're beginning to use the terminology healthcare consumer, health consumer, because in reality, we are a consumer as a, as a patient, and we're going to evaluate you as a consumer standpoint. And using it as the health consumer or person-centered care, individual-centered care, realizing in the back of our mind that the individual can be a family unit or a non-family unit, non-blood family unit, a family unit is a support family. And that is what patient advocates and liaisons and navigators can become. And that is a, a service part of healthcare, I think so few people know so little about that you don't have to be a professional to be an advocate. And the patient does know their own body best, 
we know how they manage things at home. Family member advocate knows that better than anyone. And I used to tell my patients, and this is a good takeaway point, is you know yourself and your body better than anyone else. And maybe you are that one person that can only take one Tylenol as opposed to two, because taking two knocks you out for a day and puts you to sleep and makes you non-functional and you have different reactions and being able to say, you know what? Every time I do this, this happens because we are all individuals. We're all different. Everybody's DNA is different. And we need to remember that the patient is their own expert. They may not know what it is they're trying to describe or why it's happening. To them, it's happening. And getting into the patient's vernacular uh, is very important with all of that. And I like person-centered care. One of my favorite questions that I, that I would ask a patient was not, so, so what is, what's your problem today? So the problem today might be the cat threw up. The real issue that they're having problems with is their blood pressure is high, they have a headache and they've had a nosebleed. So I always ask them, what, what's going on with you? What, what's happening in you that's about you seeking help at this moment right now? Yeah. And taking it from there. That's a really great way to start, Joanne. Absolutely. And it, I apologize to everybody. We are out of time. We are actually two minutes over. So I'm so, so sorry. As Joanne said, we could talk about this for a whole other hour. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us. Um, if you want to learn more about a person-centered culture of safety, please see our actionable patient safety solutions. It's called creating a foundation for safe and reliable care. Um, and um, and we will continue to have this conversation because I know that there's lots and lots that we have to do to fix this. So thank you, Anthony, Joanne, and Abdulayla, and thank you everybody for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.